Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to get on here today to do a quick word before uh, meeting with uh, a brother for some discipleship and prayer tonight. I'm going to be reading from Luke, and it's Luke, bear with me one moment, Luke 12, and it's going to be verses 35 to 40. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Jesus is coming back. The Bible says that Jesus is coming back like a thief in the night. The Bible also says that no one knows the day or the hour of his return, but that we need to be sober minded, watchful, always alert, prepared, ready for his coming. One of the first things that this, this passage says is to be dressed. But what does it mean to be dressed? This particular part is referring to having on the appropriate attire. Did you know that we have to have on appropriate attire that is required for the wedding feast? Imagine showing up to a wedding ceremony wearing filthy rags, which our righteousness is without the shed blood, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, without making him our Lord and Savior, without putting our faith in the gospel and repenting of our sin. We are wearing those filthy rags without those things. Imagine showing up to a wedding ceremony wearing filthy rags. You wouldn't even get past the door. You would be stopped at the gate. The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. So we need to make sure that the garment we have on is not tattered and worn. We need to make sure the garment we have on is clean and undefiled. And that it wasn't tailored by man-made efforts. Christ's righteousness is the perfect fit for this ceremony. Nothing else will do. When we are trying to meet God's righteous requirement through our own efforts, we are improperly dressed for the marriage supper. You are not saved by works. You are saved by God's grace through faith. It is no work of your own, lest any man could boast. The requirement is this, you must be born again. You must be born again by water in the spirit. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus. You must be sealed with the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You must be sealed for the day of redemption. That is the appropriate attire. When we are trying to meet God's righteous requirement through our own efforts, we will fail every time. We are improperly dressed for the marriage supper. Imagine if you will, standing among all these other people who had on the appropriate attire for such an event and knowing you were underdressed for the occasion. You would stand out and not in a good way. It would be clear how ill-equipped you are in the moment, how out of place. Do you have on the right clothes for the second coming? Are you ready? Are you truly ready? Are you prepared? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if Jesus cracked the sky tomorrow, I'm going up. I'm going with him. I'm going to be with my father in heaven. I'm, he, I'm going to the place that he said he has prepared for those who love him. A place we can't even imagine. I has not seen nor ear heard the things prepared for those that love the Lord. 
Let me ask you this. Are you trying to pour new wine into old wineskins? The old wineskins are your old former carnal nature. But if you were baptized, you were buried, you were joined to Christ in his death burial and resurrection the old you was buried and rose to new life hallelujah rose to new life you are supposed to be a new creation do you see that change in you or are you trying to pour new wine into old wineskins it won't work the bible says it couldn't be contained in the new skins it would burst wide open you need to be crucified with Christ, not just in word, but in deed for God's spirit to abide in you. Jesus said, abide in me, meaning to remain, remain in me, remain in relationship with me. And I will abide in you. I'm not talking about your own deeds, like keeping the Sabbath. I'm not talking about adorning, not adorning yourself, not wearing a head covering or wearing a head covering. I'm not talking about dressing modestly or tithing 10% every week. Yes, God loves these things, but the Holy Spirit is the one to convict us of sin. You don't convict you. Notice how I said convict and not condemn because there is a big difference. Condemnation is a fear of punishment. Condemnation comes from Satan. There is therefore no, no condemnation in Christ Jesus. A spirit of condemnation causes unhealthy fear. However, the fear of the Lord is a reverent holy fear and it's the beginning of wisdom. And the fear of the Lord, according to the Bible, says you are to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. A spirit of condemnation causes unhealthy fear where you're always sweating bullets, wondering whether or not the last sin was the last chance you had. Thinking when God goes silent that he is angry with you and his spirit has now left when he says, I never leave or forsake you, but we can leave him. We can forfeit our own soul. He gives us free will. It is our choice. So what is our service and what does it mean to be ready for service? Jesus said he didn't come to be served, but to serve. First Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Part of our armor in Ephesians 6 is the shoes of readiness or preparation, which is being emphasized here, being ready, being prepared. The shoes of readiness of preparation of the gospel of peace are just part of that readiness and preparation. So what is our service? Romans 12.1 says this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, other versions say, I urge you. By the mercies of God that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Jesus presented his body. God presented himself in the person of Jesus Christ as a living sacrifice. And we are no different. When we are born again, we died to our old self. We died to our former nature. And now we are to present ourselves as our bodies as a living sacrifice sacrifice we are to place our body on the altar every day we are to present our bodies as instruments of righteousness holy and acceptable unto god which is your reasonable service there it is presenting your body as a living sacrifice walking in the will of the lord and not your own is your reasonable service other versions say that it's your true and proper worship. So contrary to popular belief, worship is not just dancing in the church, doing cartwheels throughout the pews. Yes, that's all fine and good, but worship is actually a lifestyle. Worship is your conduct. Worship is how you treat God's people. Worship is when you show mercy, when you are shown none. That's your true and proper worship. Worship is showing compassion when people are not compassionate towards you. 
Worship is forgiveness. When that person has done everything um, to, to hurt, harm, betray, falsely accuse you, and you love them anyway, that is your true and proper worship. So worship is your daily conduct. It's a lifestyle. It's not singing songs at church every Sunday or Saturday, depending on what day you go. It's more than just a Sunday service. It is your life now. Matthew 23 11 ESV says the greatest among you shall be your servant. Stature, position, influence, and titles do not matter at all in the kingdom of heaven. This is the upside down kingdom. The kingdom of heaven lives in you when you have been born again. You bring the kingdom of heaven everywhere you go the kingdom of heaven is brought to the earth through you the same spirit that raised jesus christ from the dead dwells on the inside of every born again believer who has truly repented of their sin and believed in the gospel and repentance contrary to popular belief is not saying god i'm sorry every time you sin Repentance is actually a change of mind that produces a changed life. Matthew 5.16 says this, So let, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You're not supposed to get the glory out of your good works. Take all that praise and all that flattery that's being directed at you for being so good and glorify your Father in heaven. He is the reason why you can do any good works at all. He is the reason any of us can do any good works at all. There is nothing good in us apart from Jesus Christ. Jesus made it clear he is the vine, we are the branches. Apart from him, we can't do anything. Oh, but we love to try. We love to try to exert ourselves and walk in our own strength. But we are in a supernatural war, brothers and sisters. We really do not need to try to go up against the devil and his entourage in our own strength. That is a losing battle. Where are you finding your strength? Where are you finding your strength? Because you need to be finding it at the feet of Jesus. He is your present help in times of trouble. The Lord is the lifter of your head. I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. Hallelujah. You can't do anything apart from him. You do not have what it takes to fight a holy war on this earth against the forces of darkness without his spirit dwelling in you. And without a constant, intimate, and personal relationship with him on the daily and dying to your old self more and more and more and more. And becoming more like Christ more and more and more and more from glory to glory because that is what it means for us to be a Christian. It means little Christ. This is not religion. This is, this is not dry, dead, powerless religion. Let me put it to you like that it is religion with relationship religion without relationship is dry dead and powerless there is a people who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof you have on the wrong clothes go get yourself a garment of righteousness and try not to wear your own righteousness because that's filthy rags before your father in heaven it's filthy rags before the Lord. Colossians 3.25 tells us a little something about service. It says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. That means to put your all into everything you do as if you are working for the Lord. And that also means how you treat people when you go out and about how we react and how we respond this is why we need to die to our flesh because our flesh is ugly and our flesh is prideful and our flesh is all about self 
and that needs to die so that you can live for Christ. He's got a plan for you. God has a plan for you. He wants you to walk this thing out. But you have to let go of everything that you are holding on to in this world because the earth is passing away and everything in it. Everything in it. It says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Ask the Lord to increase your zeal for all things concerning his kingdom. Knowing the times that we're in, ask him to take away your desire for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Ask him to pluck every idol out of your heart so that you can work heartily doing everything as unto him. We're told in the Bible not to grow weary in our well-doing. But we're also told that when we do get weary, that we're supposed to come to him and he will give us rest. But instead of going to Jesus, many of us run to many other things that are not going to be able to help you when you're in that weary, depleted place. You are only going to get temporary satisfaction from the things you're running to. But when you come to him, when you are weary, he promises you rest. This is rest unlike anything you can get from worldly activity. This is a peace that surpasses all understanding. This is a peace that makes no earthly sense. This is a refreshment for your soul. Galatians 5.13, Apostle Paul says this, you were called to freedom. The Bible says, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You were called to freedom, but not to use that freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, we are to serve one another. That's our reasonable service. Serving one another in love without grumbling and without complaint. That's our flesh. That's what needs to die. When you do everything as unto the Lord, you want to do whatever he asks of you without grumbling and without complaint. Even in the midst of inconveniences, even in the midst of trials and tribulations, even in the midst of hardship, whether you are base or whether you are bound. Service is a requirement for every believer. But it doesn't, it doesn't give you some kind of special standing with God. God does not approve of you more because of your works or your good deeds. God approves of you because of the shed blood, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you placing your faith in the finished work of the cross. God approves of you because you humbled yourself enough to repent of your sin. Again, repentance is not a continuous apology every time you mess up. A broken and a contrite heart is what brings repentance. When you're actually distraught over your wretched state. Realizing where you have found yourself and acknowledging in that moment that you need a savior. Acts 3.19 says, repent therefore and be converted. Be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord brings times of refreshing. He refreshes your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And a lot of times our mind, will, and emotions can be in turmoil because of the things we've been through in this life. So true repentance brings conversion, transformation, and change. It's impossible for it not to. Let's go back to Luke 12, 35. We're told to keep our lamps burning. So... How do we do that? What does that even mean? Matthew 6.22 tells us the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. We need to be mindful of what we entertain with our eyes. 
If your eyes are always gazing upon lustful images, it only makes sense for your heart to follow. And then you wonder why your marriage is in a shambles because you can't keep your eye off another woman or man because that is what you are saturating your thoughts with through your eyes, through your ears. The Bible says that when a man or woman lusts after another person in their heart, they have already committed adultery with that other person. So you think, well, I haven't actually gone and cheated on my wife or I haven't actually gone or cheated on my husband. No, just thinking about another woman or man lustfully when you are in a covenant partnership, you have committed adultery with that other person in your heart. The Bible says if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. This doesn't mean to go cut your eye out literally. It's not in a literal sense. It's describing the severity of sin that we are to take it seriously. It's saying in that case, remove whatever your eye is lusting after. Cancel the internet. Delete that account if you have to. Shut down social media for a while. Flee from where the temptation is. To flee means to run. Leviticus 6.12 And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning. Every morning. Daily. Daily presenting yourself as a sacrifice. Every morning. Getting up. Seeking the Lord the first thing in the morning. Thinking about him before you go to bed at night. Jesus is the great high priest of heaven. Your body is the living sacrifice. Getting in his presence is the altar. If you don't tend to a fire, eventually it burns out. It must be stoked. In this case, with prayer, praise, worship, the word, fasting, Applying the word you learn to your daily life. Getting in the presence of God. This is how we fan those flames. For our God is an all-consuming fire and he wants to consume every part of you. The oil is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled up with the spirit of the living God. We need to be filled up with the love of God and the fruits of his spirit. We need to be filled up with his righteousness. According to 2 Timothy 3.16, righteousness needs to actually be practiced. The more we practice something, the better we get in that area. The more we improve. This is what 2 Timothy 3.16 says in the ESV. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So, another way that we make sure that we have the right clothes on for the marriage supper is to be meditating on the word day and night. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you his ways. Invite him into your reading time. Ask questions. What does this mean? Who is speaking? Who are they speaking to? How does this apply to me? How can I apply this in my daily life? Then actually silence yourself long enough and you might even get an answer. Make it personal. Ask the Lord for daily cleansing and purification. Ask him to purify your vessel and remove every impure, unclean thing. Ask him to purify your thoughts and renew your mind. Plead holiness and purity over your mind, heart, will, and emotions in Jesus' name. Ask the Lord to regenerate your soul and remove every vile, defiled, and corruptible mindset, attitude, mannerism, behavior, thought, mood, emotion, feeling, desire, or ambition. See yourself with Christ in heavenly places because as his child, that is exactly where you are. Sin no longer has any power over you. Sin only has the power that we give it. The devil is a liar. He only has the power that you give him.
Sin causes separation. Sin causes a divide between us and God. Sin silences the voice of the Holy Spirit and makes it harder for us to connect with God. We are to put on the righteousness of Christ every single day as we would a garment. I ask you again, do you have on the right clothes?